This video is for men who have been newly diagnosed with prostate cancer and upon your diagnosis, your PSA came back over 1,000. Now, I understand that this is a concerning situation, but today, Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, is gonna talk about what your options are and how to handle it. So in today's video, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about prostate cancer patients who have been newly diagnosed, and when they had their PSA test, it came back as 1,000 and above. Now, these cases do happen here in the U.S., but especially internationally when PSA testing just isn't happening, and these patients are now finding themselves in a whirlwind where they need to take care of the situation. So can you describe really what the situation is with prostate cancer when the PSA is that high? Yeah, it usually mostly means that they're going to get some scans and they'll find spots of cancer uh, probably in the bones, lymph nodes, uh, occasionally in other locations. But newly diagnosed hormone sensitive metastatic disease is a common category of prostate cancer that's been researched pretty thoroughly in uh, you know, what the optimal management is for these people. Patients have to have some sort of a pathologic diagnosis, but things like Gleason score are not going to be as important because Gleason score is particularly useful for determining who's likely to metastasize. These patients already have metastases, and what's going to be much more important, figuring out the prognosis going forward, is their response to treatment. Biologic variations of prostate cancer are vast, and some patients will have variants of prostate cancer that are very sensitive to treatment, and the, the cancer will, will literally melt away and other patients will have variants of prostate cancer that are more resistant and don't respond as well. And that response to treatment becomes the new defining factor in these patients, and that's reflected in something called the PSA nadir. That's, does the PSA get down to less than 0.1 or not within six or so months of starting therapy? Patients who go on state-of-the-art treatment and can't get their PSA down to undetectable levels or less than 0.1, are those that have more difficult variants and have a more uh, worrisome prognosis than the patients that get a good response to treatment. So I think one of the first major concerns that patients have is the fact that they do have metastases. But I think a lot of patients don't understand, and as you're stating, that you know treatments can be effective. So can you talk about some of the cases or the fact that even metastases doesn't equal a death sentence? Because I think a lot of times in other cancers, once it's metastasized and spread throughout their body, you know, it's more severe as far as the situation is, and people don't really understand that prostate cancer is different. Yes, so the goal is to get into a complete remission, even if someone presents with widespread metastasis and a PSA over a 1,000, uh, and that's not an unrealistic goal. Not everyone is going to be able to achieve that, but it's not uncommon, and uh, I've had a number of patients who've uh, gone on hormone therapy uh, with or without some sort of chemotherapy. Uh, who've been able to get undetectable PSAs, go into a complete remission, stop hormonal treatment, and enjoy the return of their testosterone. This is all potentially feasible. The research examining what gives you the best chances of such a rosy outcome um, indicate that you want to be on both first and second generation hormonal therapy, and you also want to initiate a relatively mild type of chemotherapy called taxotere and have four to six injections of this medicine over a 12 to 18 week period uh, at some time during the induction period. And the combination of these, these different agents then uh, optimizes the chance for getting into a complete remission. What's being looked at now, of course, that we have PSMA PET scans is whether after going through that induction uh, treatment that I just outlined, is there any viable residual cancer left behind that can still be detected on a PSMA PET scan after, say, 6 to 12 months after diagnosis and the initiation of treatment? Uh, and would those patients benefit from some sort of spot radiation if there's a few resistant areas of uh, disease that are detected on a PSMA PET scan? This is kind of keying off of the oligometastatic research, but uh, certainly it's not uh, mainstream thinking. Uh, as these scans are so new, we don't have any long-term studies yet. From your experience, because you've treated thousands of patients with prostate cancer, how many times have you seen it be effective that somebody does do spot radiation after having hormone therapy and chemo? A lot. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, prostate cancer is oftentimes you don't 
know how something's going to turn out until you try and treat it and see how well it works. The neat thing about uh, spot radiation is that in skillful hands, it usually doesn't incur a lot of side effects. When we're getting nervous about the administration of radiation, it's usually a radiation to the prostate gland that is right next to the bladder, right next to the rectum, that presents these difficulties. And the doses of radiation that are administered to that prostate gland are high. So skill and proper uh, uh, equipment, very, very important. Um, if it's just a spot on the rib or on a, on a leg bone or something like that, the radiation is usually free of side effects. So the idea of chasing some spots with radiation uh, is not that daunting because most uh, of the time you're not going to see any side effects. So why not give it a try? I think a question we get oftentimes is, do we need to treat the prostate and, and deal with the localized issue in order for there not to be further metastasis after treatment has occurred? Right, that's a somewhat kind of controversial area and for a good reason because there is preliminary evidence that suggests that if you're able to get someone's PSA down to 0.1 or lower, uh, with the combination of treatments that I've outlined, in most cases there will be some uh, cancer that will survive in the prostate. That was where the largest tumor was to begin with. Now that radiation treatment is getting to be more tolerable, the idea of sterilizing the prostate is a logical consideration. I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but just as we mentioned, chasing down any residual hot spots that still persist after 6 to 12 months, uh, treating the prostate as well is a something to be discussed. Uh, we all know the downside of that sort of thing, uh, you know, difficulty uh, with bladder or rectal problems or sexual function, uh, and there's a trade-off there. Uh, if a person has uncontrolled metastatic disease, I don't think anyone's going to talk about treating the prostate. But for those that have gotten into a remission and it appears that there's still um, ongoing active cancer in the prostate or in other parts of the body, eradicating it with some radiation, should be on the table for discussion. So when we're talking about hormone-sensitive patients who are newly diagnosed, what is the percentage of men who would be hormone-sensitive? Is it all men? Is it more like 30% are going to be more effective versus 70? How does that work? Well, in men that come in with these really high PSA levels and widely metastatic disease, the exact statistics could probably be um, uh, elucidated from some of the clinical trials that have been done in uh, hormone-sensitive, newly diagnosed metastatic disease. Off the top of my head, I don't know the numbers, but there are men, uh, let's say half of them, are going to run into a situation where the, the PSA will decline, indicating that there's some hormone sensitivity in practically everybody, but maybe half of them are going to come up short and won't be able to get their PSA all the way down to less than 0.1. The failure for the PSA to get to less than 0.1 within six months or so of starting hormone treatment is a sign of hormone resistance. It's not uncommon, but it's not universal. So as far as the treatment process goes and the monitoring process of PSA after, how long are they on the hormone therapy? How long are they on the chemo? And then how long would you wait to get the PSMA scan in order to see if you do need to do spot radiation? Well, the studies done in high-risk prostate cancer indicate that you probably want to do at least 18 months of hormone deprivation to get maximal anti-cancer benefit. And of course, you make a distinction as to whether people get their PSA undetectable or not. The use of taxotere chemotherapy is uh, usually prescribed for six injections, three weeks apart. That would be an 18-week protocol, uh, sometime while you're on the hormone treatment. If the PSA is undetectable I would, and you've completed the taxotere treatment, then uh, getting a P PSMA PET scan to make sure there's no persistent active disease uh, you know, after nine months of uh, induction treatment would be a logical thing. Before stopping the hormone therapy, uh, it would be good to get a PSMA PET scan and uh, make sure there's no persistent active disease. I think a question we get oftentimes, especially from the international audience, is how soon do they need to start hormone therapy once they realize that they do have metastatic cancer? Well, I'm not sure I see any reason for delay. As long as the staging studies have been completed, uh, the idea of getting an accurate baseline as to where the cancer has originally spread to, I think is useful. And uh, prostate cancer does tend to melt away quickly once you begin hormone treatment. The idea is to get all the staging scans done and then start the hormone treatment 
right soon thereafter. So with hormone therapy, there are various side effects, and some of them are fatigue, hot flashes, a lack of interest in sexual activity. And then with chemotherapy, you also have fatigue and some stomach issues and things like that. Does the combination of those two therapies together, is it tolerable, or are there certain things that patients can do to make it more tolerable? It's tolerable for patients that are diligent and uh, fitness training, resistance training, and keeping their muscles strong, uh, which is a hard thing to ask of people when they're going through this process, but it is so essential. They may have to diminish their activity and the intensity of their workouts when they're getting taxotere, but it has um, been clearly shown in a number of studies that with both hormone therapy and with taxotere, and certainly with a combination, that men are, that are getting to the gym three days a week and doing some weight training, whatever they can manage, that they're going to tolerate this process so, so much better than those that are not making that type of an investment. So weightlifting is kind of more of a lifestyle change. Are there any other lifestyle changes like diet where a patient can, you know, maybe go into a vegan diet or maybe take, you know, animal products out? And will that have an effect on the PSA or have any anti-cancer effects? My personal conviction is that it has a lot of effect. Cancer hurts people by growing and multiplying, and if you don't feed it well, it uh, won't grow as quickly and won't multiply as easily. Uh, our normal cells, our body, responds pretty well to a deprived state and can adapt. Cancer cells are a little more stupid, and they don't like to grow unless you force feed them with lots of animal protein and animal fat, uh, at least prostate cancer. Uh, there is confusion out there because there are other types of cancer that uh, feed off of sugars more, pancreas cancers, lymphomas, lung cancers. People tend to think all cancers are the same. Prostate cancer is very different in that studies indicate that uh, animal protein, animal fats are the uh, substances that help uh, generate prostate cancer growth more quickly. One of the things that we do on this channel is we like to talk about hope. And I think that when patients are in a situation where their PSA is that high and they've been newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, they're in a very concerning and intense situation. From your experience of treating prostate cancer, thousands of prostate cancer for patients for over 30 years, how many times have you seen that these treatments have been effective and patients are able to monitor and live years um, even after this type of a diagnosis? Oh, it's not uncommon at all. I think the idea of not giving up and really making sure that you're getting access to these medicines that we're talking about is so important. Uh, I think it was um, even before uh, Taxotere was FDA approved in the United States, we had a patient come to us with a PSA over 1,000, and uh, he had been on Lupron. We didn't have second-generation hormonal treatments at that time, and so his, uh, his disease had become resistant to Lupron. Lung cancer patients were really excited about Taxotere, which was FDA approved for lung cancer in the United States, uh, probably around 1998 uh, that this occurred. This patient had a lot of bone metastasis, and the hope was that maybe this lung cancer agent would be useful. He got an infusion of full-dose taxotere, and the side effects for him were intolerable. We didn't have effective anti-nausea medicines back then. And uh, he said, I, I know that I need to be on medicine, but I just can't tolerate this. So we adapted the infusion, and this later became a popular thing, is to give smaller doses of taxotere on a weekly basis so that it would be more manageable. And he tolerated that very well. And remarkably, his PSA, which was over 1,000, dropped down to less than one over the next four to six months. And uh, he went into essentially a complete remission just with taxotere. He was able to stop his Lupron shots and he resumed a normal lifestyle. And we learned a hard lesson from this. He was having some uh, blood in his stool throughout this time period. We kept ask him to go see a gastroenterologist and get a colonoscopy, and turned out that he, it was a colon cancer. And this unfortunate gentleman, uh, when he passed away from colon cancer a couple years later, he, uh, his PSA was less than 10. Surprising things like this happen, and it's always important to make sure that all these medicines that are known to be effective get a, get a shot, because you, it, things can turn out a lot better than people expect. Being newly diagnosed with prostate cancer and then having a PSA of over a thousand is a very intense and can be a very, you know, scary situation. But one of the things that we say here at PCRI is that you are not alone. 
Now I say that with confidence because not only does PCRI have resources for you, but there's also nonprofits in prostate cancer who have created resources for you as well. And so some of these I just wanna share so that you're aware of that because I don't want you to go through this process alone. One of the best ways to get connected with other prostate cancer patients is to join a support group. Now you may say, I don't have access to a support group in my area and I don't have the ability to go in person. Well, there's also virtual support groups that are held either through Zoom or over the phone. And this just allows you access to other prostate cancer patients. Now there's usually a prostate cancer you know, support group leader and they have a lot of information and education on the various treatments you may be encountering, but there's also patients who have been through the different types of treatments that you may be encountering and they can tell you about their experiences. One of the things I've seen from patients who have maybe had the most optimal care or have figured out a way to mitigate side effects, if I ask them questions, I usually find out that somehow, some way, they have a community of people supporting them and they're usually in a support group. So I would greatly encourage you to check out the links in the description and join one because I don't see you not benefiting from this somehow, some way. I think that when we talk about prostate cancer and even just us as educators, there's so much that you guys are going through and so much on a daily basis from a mental health perspective, from an emotional level, that we can't even emphasize the need for support enough. And so I would talk to somebody in your family, maybe that's your partner, maybe that's a child that you have, or a friend, and get them involved. Ask, ask them to go to doctor's appointments with you. Ask them if even they can be on FaceTime. I've walked into many doctor's appointments where I've seen patients, you know, having a FaceTime call with their caregiver. And it just helps to really you know, bring that presence with you, somebody else to remember what the doctor said. I think another thing that's very helpful is asking the doctor if you can record the session and reviewing that later with somebody who can support you. And another version of support is through our helpline. You can contact us at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through a lot of the treatments that we talk about, and they give you information, not advice. But one of the things that they do is they help prepare you for your doctor's appointment so that you're empowered and you know the right questions to ask, you know how to advocate for yourself, and you know what your options are ahead of time. So when your doctor comes in and hands you this information, you're not blindsided, you don't have to make a decision right there and then, or you can come into the appointment knowing what decision you want to make. They can help you research a lot of the different you know, locations and what a PSMA scan is, what is the process, what is my PSA looking like? And they give you a lot of information that just overall will help you through this process. I cannot emphasize enough that I don't want you to go through this alone. I care about you, the PCRI cares about you. What you are going through is intense. But as you heard Dr. Scholl say, he knows hundreds, if not thousands of men who have had PSAs over a thousand and have had really great outcomes where they've lived for years. But I also don't want you to go through the side effects of these you know, different treatments in silence. I want you to get the help that you need not only for choosing a treatment, but also for dealing with any negative side effects you may be experiencing. Because again, through support groups, through the helpline, through the support that you may be doing, and even doing your own research here at the PCRI YouTube channel, you may find things that help mitigate those side effects so that you can have a better quality of life. A lot of people don't understand just how much quality of life matters, even in the middle of a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. We want to make sure that you're living the best life that you possibly can through this process and that you are able to tolerate these treatments as best as possible. Now, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our website for more information. We have a lot of information there that we find helps a lot of patients. And if you have topics or questions or things you would like us to cover in our videos, please leave them in the comment section below this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I appreciate that you trust us.